When Don't Nod Entertainment first officially teased Vampire in June 2015, it was off the heels of Episode 3 of Life is Strange. I'd only gotten around to playing the first three episodes at that point and was dying for more. All of a sudden, the same company that made that game was teasing not only a new project, but one set in London 1918 during the height of the Spanish flu and at the end of World War I. Well, as a fan of both narrative-driven games and a history buff, I was right proper chuffed, mate, cure bribe. I, and I assume quite a lot of people, got the distinct impression that Vampire was, more or less, going to be like Life is Strange. Mostly narrative, focused on dialogue and player choice, with maybe a little more action and combat. Don't nod themselves led with that angle. Here's a truncated quote from that announcement. Carefully study the habits of your next victim, his or her relationships with other characters, and set up your strategy to feed unnoticed. Be careful who you choose to hunt, as they will be gone forever, and their death will impact in a meaningful way the world that surrounds you. There will be times when exploration and seduction will only get you so far, and you'll need to resort to engaging in Vampire's dynamic, real-time combat! Mm -hmm. It blends hard-hitting melee with range shooting mechanics and the supernatural vampire powers. So I think you can see why I thought that way. Combat sounds like an afterthought in that quote, right? No. Maybe that was the case back then, but when they debuted the first gameplay trailer a few months later? Uh, nope. Weird zombie-like creatures roaming empty streets, all action and really bland-looking combat. This was not at all what I was expecting, and the about face put me off the game for years. But now Vampire's been out for several months, and despite its mixed reviews, the game has apparently performed well, and now has the honor of receiving a blessed Switch port. Praise be, praise be, all hail thine holy Switch. Sorry, you have to say that any time you mention the Switch on the internet. It's even getting a TV adaptation. I can't wait to see how awful that'll be. With all this news of late, and with Halloween having come and gone, I decided to put my resentment aside and give Vampire an honest try. What do I think of it? Well, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, you're too kind. <laughs> Seriously, this game's not very good. Steady boys, we've got one of them! After all the confusing marketing, what is Vampire anyway? Well, now that I've played the game for myself, I can't really tell you I'm any less confused. Don't Nod sells it as an RPG. You can definitely see elements of that here. It's also an open world game, though the world is very small and restrictive. You can only go certain routes to get from point A to point B, and there's no fast travel. This game is certainly nothing like Life is Strange, more akin to Don't Nod's first game, Remember Me. What an ironic title in retrospect. The setting is one you don't see in video games often. It's November 1918 London, either just days before or days after the end of World War I, yet the misery isn't over yet. Throughout 1918, the world was gripped by one of the deadliest plagues in history, known as the Spanish Flu. In October and November of that year saw a massive second wave for the pandemic ravaging Europe in particular. Quite a useful time to be a doctor, which you are, by the way. You play as Dr. Jonathan Reed, a world-renowned surgeon famous for his breakthrough discoveries in the world of blood transfusions. His life was turned upside down, though, by World War I and the subsequent flu outbreak. If anyone's read Robert Ryan's John Watson novel Dead Man's Land, you'll notice that sounds eerily familiar. In fact, identical, but that's probably just a coincidence? 
Regardless, it's also an interesting time to be a vampire, which you also are, in case you didn't pick up on that. At the start of the game, a mysterious figure transforms you into an undead immortal Edward Cullen, and you take it upon yourself to track this man down and discover why he turned you, and what secrets are being kept behind the curtain of the flu. I just made a Twilight joke in 2018. Talk about undead jokes, huh? <laughs> Yeah. That's not only a narrative setup either, you really do get to decide who to feast on. Anyone you want in this game, knowing that you're going to have to kill whoever you bite. But being a doctor isn't a setup either, you also work at the Pembroke Hospital, and have to go around checking not only your patients, but also random people in the street and make sure they're healthy. If not, you can craft and give them medicine, which will improve the quality of their blood. See, the sicker a person is, the less experience points you'll get from their blood. And if someone has an infectious disease or illness, they could spread it to others they come into contact with as well. So if everyone's healthy, you get a ton of XP when you bite someone, but if everyone's dead or dying, you get very little. This system perfectly represents the dichotomy at the heart of Vampire. On one hand, that sounds fantastic, doesn't it? It's a living, breathing ecosystem in which multiple systems feed into each other, and it all makes sense. You're a doctor, you have to help people because it's your job, and you might want to anyway, but you're also a vampire, so you have to help them regardless to improve their blood quality so you can get more XP to fight the vampire hunters who are after you. But there's an added element as well. There's nothing actually forcing you to drink blood and kill people. You can, theoretically at least, go around the whole game without drinking any blood or killing any wi well, any non-vampire hunter character. No one seems to care if you kill the hunters. This will give you no XP at all, so you'll have to rely on crappy weapons and not super badass vampire attacks that'll make combat a breeze. This will also mean there are more people to take care of and more opportunities for people to get sick, so you have to keep making more medicine. If you do kill and drink blood, then prices at shops will go up, and people will die, meaning you won't get to do their side quests or other side quests. And having dead bodies everywhere will increase the chances of people getting sick anyway, and more vampire hunters will come after you, and it's it's just a big mess. It's a lose-lose situation no matter what you pick, but in a good way. It's a balancing act that you have to nail for the most efficient playthrough, or you can be an evil bastard killing everyone for the sake of it, or a saint and make everything hard on yourself. However, there is the slight problem that this system doesn't really work. Vampire is two games in one, a brilliant narrative historical detective romp and a poorly made action thriller. The writing is top notch, definitely better than Life is Strange. One thing I bloody love is that you can talk to every single NPC in the game, and not a tip your cowboy hat to them and say, howdy. These are full-blown, not semi-blown, but full-blown conversations that all have an impact. Some people might give you a side quest, a smaller errand to run, or a clue about a quest you're doing for somebody else, or they might tell you something about another NPC that can unlock more dialogue options or quests with that person, and every NPC has something to say about London, the war, the flu, other residents, or you, all adding to the atmosphere. This version of London feels like a real city even if only like 10 people seem to live there, it's super small and restricted and it literally never stops raining. Unfortunately, you can't really see that great writing in the opening sequence. Piercing the flesh of the sinner, one prayer for the summoned called by this song. It is perhaps the countdown to oblivion for the once proud city of London. It is perchance her inhabitants last dance alone to face death and pestilence. Confronted by the eerie and unknown, mortals became desperate for answers. The game begins with gibberish, no other way to put it. I think it's supposed to sound satanic and spooky, but it's nonsense. After this attempt at a cutscene, you wake up upon being turned to a vampire and immediately bite a woman. So much for being able to play the whole game without killing anyone. My first thought was, why is this game forcing me to bite someone I want to play through without killing? 
until I realize that woman is your sister, so obviously this is a forced narrative thing. Okay, whatever. You're then immediately chased by vampire hunters, a secret society called the Guards of Prewin that you pretty much have to kill. Though I do like how when you slice someone's face off, Reed profusely apologizes for it, saying he only did it because he had to, and if you keep killing them, then he slowly starts to change into a monster, talking about feeling his powers growing inside him. That's a really nice touch of character establishment and development, even this early in the game. As far as I'm concerned, Vampire doesn't really begin until you get away from these pre-win guards and are allowed to freely explore. And that's when you really start to see the promise of this game. This section does at least do a good job of introducing our protagonist. There's no massive exposition dump like there was in Coffee Talk, which I covered in last week's video. Jonathan Reed is by himself. He has no reason to say, I am Jonathan Reed. I've been turned to a vampire. That's my sister over there looking for me. I better say hi. I was coming home from the war to see my mother and get back to my practice. This is my story. You learn that naturally throughout the game by just talking to people and hearing what he has to say. It's little things like that throughout the game that makes the writing so good. Few people are ever forthcoming with you, and your mind control powers only go so far. A big part of the game is slowing down, talking to NPCs about certain events or people, and picking up clues that you can use as ammunition and discussions later. It feels so much more organic than something like Fallout 4, where you just unload a bunch of points into a speech skill and magically talk everyone you meet into telling you their life stories. This introduction also lets you know right away that the combat here is shite on toast. <laughs> Vampire has some of the worst combat I've ever seen in a video game. To say it's broken would be an insult to Leon R. Walker, and I don't even know who that is. You have a handful of very basic moves and some advanced stuff if you level up enough, but if you're like me and decide to play the game non-lethally, you'll spend most of your time with primary attack, secondary attack, and dodge, and that's it. For a start, simply hitting your target is half the battle. Between the camera getting locked up focusing on something on the other side of the map and the stiff robotic movement of Jonathan Reed, half the challenge of combat is simply hitting your mark. You do have a lock-on feature that helps a lot, but then you just end up getting swarmed by other enemies because you're too busy focused on the bullet sponge in front of you. Enemies are also overpowered, as they have a ton of health, they always appear in groups of three or more, they have more ranged attacks than you, and generally deal more damage to you than you can do to them. Sometimes melee enemies can even group together and pin you to a wall, killing you pretty much instantly with no way of stopping it. The camera is such a pain because it stays in a fixed position during combat, even as you run and dodge around, meaning you have to move it yourself as you're trying to stay alive. You can lock onto an enemy as I said, but then you're still missing half the battlefield. Here's where we come back to the blood sucking mechanic and why I think Vampire is totally crippled. You need to suck blood to get experience points, which will unlock new powerful vampiric attacks, but doing so can also give you more health, more stamina, or let you carry more healing items or bullets. Yes, that means the entire blood sucking system only rewards you with a greater combat prowess. So if you're like me and are doing a non-lethal playthrough, then you're utterly screwed. There is no reward whatsoever for not sucking people's blood. None. Nothing. Nada. Zip. You just make the game incredibly difficult for yourself with no reward. On the flip side, if you do go around and drink blood, then congratulations, you've made the game really easy. Sure, there will be more vampire hunters this way, but you'll tear through them all so easily with your ludicrous amounts of health, healing items, ammo, and your powerful attacks that it doesn't matter. Plus, NPCs don't really seem to care all that much about them either. If you want to do your side quests, then do it before you kill those NPCs. Not exactly rocket surgery there. Then there's the fact that nobody cares if you kill the pre-win guards. Seriously, I killed a ton of them in one spot and nobody cares. None of the NPCs comment on it. There were no more pre-win guards the next night. None of my vampire allies had anything to say about it. Nobody else got sick. I killed all these people and nothing happened. It's like these enemies exist in a separate realm, divorced from the system that's supposed to be the main draw of this game. So vampire's big selling points of 
player choice and consequences for your actions and the blood sucking system comes down to nothing more than combat, which itself doesn't have any impact on the rest of the game. Sure, prices go up at shops if you suck people off. Yeah, you knew that joke was coming, didn't you? But you get so many materials, weapons, and ammos from just looting bodies or searching the environment that I never bothered going to a shop anyway. I found out pretty quickly in my non-lethal playthrough that it's easy to run past most enemies. When I discovered that, I never fought again. Until I had to, thanks to a side quest. So after dying for about the 800th time and not wanting to let the game win by drinking blood, I gave up. I didn't quit the game, mind. I instead took advantage of a recent update that added a story mode. Story mode makes the combat super easy, to the point of almost non-existence, which is what I'd say the game should have been to begin with, but now I'm repeating myself. This does take away any semblance of the blood-sucking mechanic having any meaning, but frankly, the game is just better this way. The combat really is that awful, and getting any chance to get rid of it is worth it, whatever the cost. Look, I'm not really proud of what I did, but I had no say in the matter. I was getting killed in every single combat scenario I encountered because I was so underleveled. Don't not insist that you can complete the game without drinking blood, but I don't believe them. Maybe it's a case of me being shit. Yeah, no, I am. But I couldn't get more than three or four hours before I hit a brick wall. Part of that was how hard the combat was, but also how awful it was too, and I didn't want to suffer through it anymore. But you know, those those are just the big problems, especially with the blood sucking mechanic. There's more wrong with that yet. Remember how I said you can heal sick people? Well, all you have to do to diagnose someone is hit your vampire mode button, see what illness they have, make the medicine, which only requires a few easy to obtain crafting items, and then give it to them, which you can easily do because you use your mind control powers to force them to take it. That's all there is to it. You do have to find recipes for the medication, and people can get sick again with something else after you cure them, but it's easy to find the recipes, easy to craft medicine, and easy to diagnose illnesses and give people medicine, so what's the point? Also, even if you don't bother healing people, you still get XP anyway, just less of it. You still get enough XP to be effective in combat, even if the person you're drinking from is half dead. Oh, and you can even get by on drinking the blood of rats. It doesn't give you much XP, but you can farm enough to get by on them and vampire hunters alone. For some reason, the hunters don't die when you bite them, and nobody seems to care if you drink from them either, so these guys really do just exist in a separate dimension, I guess. You can even drink the blood of scowls, these half-vampire, half-zombie-like creatures that are born as a result of a vampire doing a bad job trying to turn a human into one of them. Early on in the game, you see how limited vampire systems really are. To suck blood, you have to mesmerize someone, which takes having a high mesmerize level for some, or learning more about your target. You find your first opportunity to mesmerize someone early on as part of the tutorial. It's some criminal who survived an attack and they're bleeding pretty badly. They ask for your help to take them to a hospital because they were attacked, you know, badly wounded. You are literally 10 feet away from a hospital and the administrator who just gave you the job there when this happens. So when the game forced me to mesmerize him, I said, no, I'm not going to, and tried to walk him over, well, I did mesmerize him, but I wasn't going to suck his blood. Instead, I walked him over to the hospital and the administrator and nurse standing right outside. Nobody said or did anything, and I was forced to slowly walk him all the way back to where we were, back around to some back alley where the game finally allowed me to just let him go, at which point he sat down where he was, forgetting all about his injury and not saying anything to me. To be fair, you do just go up the stairs there and tell a nurse about him and she'll go and send someone to fetch him, but it feels so antiquated being forced into the game's rigid system. Why can't I just walk him to the hospital myself, right there? We are literally 10 feet away from the hospital and the guy who just gave us a job there. Surely Don't Nod had to assume that people were going to turn around and walk him over to the hospital, right? Apparently not. The fact is, none of it matters. This isn't a game of choice and consequence, it's a game of doing what Don't Nod tells you to do, with the option of being slightly nice or slightly mean. And the woman? What? Who is she? What woman? Oh, don't play me for a fool. You used me to locate that skull. You must know who she is. And I thought you were gentlemen. You shouldn't talk about a lady behind her back. Why did Don't Nod decide to make combat, shitty, poorly made combat on top of that, such an integral part of the experience? 
Well, the cynical answer is, of course, focus testing run amok and an attempt at grabbing a larger audience at the detriment of making a better game. I have no way of knowing if that's true or not, but maybe the latter isn't necessarily a bad thing. As much as I wanted Vampire to pretty much be Life is Strange, and how the game would have been better for it, that would have brought about its own problems. Telltale's closure showed that a company sticking to the same rigid formula over and over again, producing game after game after game in rapid succession, especially a point-and-click adventure game, is suicide. Developers need to diversify their lineup, and that's what Vampire does. It's nothing like Life is Strange, just like Remember Me is nothing like Life is Strange. Even that game's sequel is shaking things up, featuring an entirely different cast going on a long road trip. Meanwhile, Dotnod's upcoming game, Twin Mirror, seems to be similar to Life is Strange, but that game is shaking things up with its bizarre mirror world and heavy emphasis on puzzles. And it's not like Telltale games didn't sell because they were terrible. They released a lot of great stuff. Tales from the Borderlands, The Wolf Among Us, and Batman were all great, but it didn't matter because everyone was tired of those games. Vampire, on the other hand, is... Uh, mediocre at best, but has sold better than MAGA hats at a KKK rally, and that's kinda what matters more? If crappy games with wasted potential is what it takes to get more really good games like Life is Strange, then I guess that's the price we have to pay. It sucks, but so does Vampire. <laughs> hey! <laughs>